6th Sunday. Um, so I've preached a number of sermons. You've heard me teach on this topic a lot. I thought, well, this year, instead of me bringing another sermon, uh, let's hear from you know, any of you who would like to share about uh, how you do your work as a Christian. And so, you know, a number of weeks ago, I sent out that uh, call by uh, email, and six of you responded that you'd be willing to talk to us, not to tell us how you've arrived or how you've got it all figured out, but how you're trying to do your work as a Christian. So we're going to hear from a number of people on this subject, how my Christian faith impacts my work. Now, I had six people, but I've lost two of them for various reasons. And um, when we get to their turn in the program, I'm actually going to open it up for you. Anybody who would like to share just a story or a, a short word about how you try to uh, do your work for the honor of the Lord, uh, you'll have an opportunity to share at that point, too. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden even of Eden to work it and to take care of it. We're created to work, and today we're going to talk about how we can do that for God's glory. The first thing we're going to do right now is we're actually going to sing a hymn. So would you turn, uh, pick uh, your hymn book in front of you? Let's turn to page 571, page 571. This is Trust and Obey, and we are going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5. You got that? Verses 1, 3, and 5 of page 571, and let's stand together to do that. And walk with the Lord in the light of his word. What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Thank you. Be seated. The first person we're going to hear from is John Graff. So John, come on up here. And if you would start out by just telling us, maybe you already were going to do this, but tell us what you do, you know, just where you work as part of what you're going to share. Good morning. So uh, I work as a software and cloud architect for the Army. And so in my job, there's a few ways that I try to, to serve and honor God. Uh, so. In Colossians 3, 22 through 24, it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So I know those verses are written directly for slaves at the time, but I think um, they really apply to how employees should, um, should function as well. So it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart 
And so that's something I definitely try to do. Um, I try to work very hard in everything I'm doing. Um, and to be honest, that comes easily for me. Uh, but it also says uh, to do it as working for the Lord and not for human masters, since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Um, and so having a proper motivation for why you're working hard is, is more difficult for me. Um, but I try to make sure I'm really focused on um, you know, not working hard so that I can get promotions or um, receive awards or be uh, recognized by people, but so that I can bring glory to God through what I'm doing. Um, the verses also say to obey not only when uh, there are, you know, your boss's eyes on you. Um, so I, I try to ensure that I have integrity in the way that I'm working, um, both how I'm working and when I'm working. Uh, and this has been a big deal, especially uh, since 2020, I've been working from home almost exclusively. And so usually nobody's watching what I'm doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are definitely, you know, I know that there are a lot of my coworkers who maybe are taking longer breaks than they should. Uh, maybe they have to run out and do errands and you just kind of, you know, make it go away. But I try to ensure that the hours that I say I'm working, I am working. If I have to run out, I tell my boss, make up the hours. Um, so I have integrity in what, I, in what I'm doing. Um, the other main thing I try to do, though, is I look for opportunities to share my beliefs and my faith. I believe that's something that God calls all of us to do. Um, and sometimes this is hard for me to do, too, especially um, because of some of the things I just talked about. Um, or at least so I, I tell myself, right? I was recently reading through Exodus, and um, when God calls Moses to be his messenger to the Israelites and to Pharaoh, Moses has a lot of excuses for why he can't do it, right? Um, he says, well, God, um, I don't know your name, so if they ask who sent me, how am I going to... How am I going to answer him, right? And he says, well, um, what if they don't believe that you sent me? What if uh, they just ignore me? Uh, he says, I'm not a good speaker. So how am I supposed to speak to Pharaoh? I'm, I'm not eloquent. And then finally he just says, can you just send someone else? Because he just doesn't want to do it, right? Um, and I feel like this is me a lot of times. So um, I have a similar list of excuses for why I can't talk to my coworkers about Jesus. Um, you know, the first one is I'm paid to do my work. And so if I'm having personal conversations during work time, um, that's not honoring to my employer. Uh, I'm an introvert. I work with introverts. We don't talk, right? Um, and just there aren't many opportunities for casual discussions, um, especially in a telework environment. You're never just standing around the water cooler anymore. You have to explicitly pick up the phone or um, get on Teams and call someone. Um, but God's actually answered a lot of these concerns and opened up opportunities for me to talk to people. Um, as we start to have on-site meetings again, people are very excited just to see each other again. So there's a lot more conversations for, just, uh, opportunities for conversations before and after the meetings. Um, people are uh, much more ready to go out to lunch, and lunch is a great place to have personal conversations. Um, and also, uh, I've started to travel a few times a year. And travel is a great time to have personal conversations with people um, if, if you look for it. Um, you know, there's time in the airport, time on the plane, as you drive around, um, at dinner, all those things, um, and even at the hotel at night. So um, in closing, you know, uh, in the last couple trips, I've, I've been very intentional in praying for opportunities to um, have those conversations, and there's one coworker in particular that I've had um, two different longer conversations with him um, where he's kind of opened up about reasons that he has trouble believing in the Bible, why he's skeptical of Christian faith, and um, he's been willing to hear from me about why I think uh, the Bible is reliable. So those are some of the things that I focus on while I'm at work. Thank you. John, that was so interesting. I found myself like wanting to ask questions. Did any of you feel like, like, talk more about this, talk more about that? But I didn't tell the question and answers. I didn't tell any of our speakers that question and answers was part of the deal this morning. But uh, maybe afterwards we can do that.
Uh, Amy Griffith is next. Amy, come on up here. Amy's a teacher, and I've uh, had the opportunity to be in her classroom. She's an excellent teacher. Looking forward to what you're going to share with us. <laughs> I have more time now, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so yes, my name is Amy Griffith. If you don't know me, I work in the Wayne Westland School District. I have worked now for 34 years. This is my 35th year. So I've seen a lot of things over the times. Um, I know that public education is under attack and um, I haven't been asked yet to teach anything that goes against my faith, but I do feel that perhaps the time will come I know that our middle schools and high schools are experiencing a lot more adversary than we are in the elementary right now. Um, I've seen more and more of the breakdown of the family, the effects of poverty, and um, the effects of more and more children not experiencing any kind of biblical teaching or stepping foot into a church. Um, there's a great need for Christian teachers in public education. Uh, it's becoming a darker, darker place, and we need light there. So I guess one of the things I'm going to ask is that you pray for our public education and that we have Christians who are being called to come and work there. Um, so uh, we were asked to talk about how we share our faith in our schools. And I appreciate um, John Graff sharing that he's not that bold sometimes, and neither am I. Um, I am... Well, we always do these color things, you know, what color are you? And I'm always a blue, and blue is where you are very peaceful, uh, very harmonious, you don't like conflict. And um, I work in a, an environment where a lot of the people are liberal and all that. So I basically um, really try to live my faith and with my actions, and I do at times get to insert things. And people at work do know that I'm a Christian, and they, um, I'm known as uh, the teacher who never swears. <laughs> so what's interesting is when I first started teaching, I was shocked that little Miss White, sweet little Miss White down the hall, swears like a sailor at lunchtime. It's just shocking, right? I mean, they never do that around the kids, and yet, oh, my land, right? So that's been a great, actually, place for me to step in as a Christian. Um, my coworkers, I have two of them, uh, Roberta and Chris, and they swear like sailors. And so I sat them down. I was really convicted one um, sermon that we had about the Lord's name, how precious it is and how powerful it is. And so I sat them down and I said, look, you, I don't care if you say any other word except for the Lord's name in vain. I said, we, you, you really shouldn't do that because it's very uh, powerful and so they respected my wishes and they've really tried not to and so I, I appreciate that but what was really funny is that we were doing these biography projects and one of my students actually did Jesus Christ and she dressed up as Jesus on the presentation day and so we were, my colleague Chris and I were walking down the hall and he dropped a book and he actually said the names the Lord's name in vain and as he looked up there was Jesus <laughs> There was Jesus, and he looked at me. <laughs> we still talk about that to this day. So that was pretty funny. Um, I get to do that with my students as well. Students uh, have started to say uh, the Lord's name in vain a lot. They hear it at home. They don't understand what the impact, they don't understand what it is. And so I will, if I catch them, I will say, I pull them aside and I say, Unless, you know, I believe Jesus is real. And if, if you're saying that, you're either praying to them, him, or talking to him. So it's actually considered a swear word. And they're like, oh. And so I get to do that throughout my school year. I get to tell them about what I believe in various aspects. They always ask me, how was the earth made? That always comes up. We do a unit on the earth. How was the earth made? And I say, well... I believe that God made the earth, but you need to decide what you believe. You need to go home and have that conversation with your parents and find out what you believe. And they're like, oh, you know. So I, and then we talk about time, like AD and BC. You know, do you know that they've changed that now? Instead of uh, after death and before Christ, they change it to before the common era. And after, I can't remember what the other one is, but I don't, I don't go by that. I said, Jesus Christ was a real person. 
whether you believe what he stands for or not, but he was actually a real person who actually walked on this earth. And his life was very influential. He was important in history. And so I tell them about how, you know, our time is based, our, our calendar is based on his life. So I get to do that once in a while. And then I'll say, you know, but then you can go home and, and ask your parents, what do you believe? Have these conversations. So throughout the year, they, they get to know me a little bit more, and, and I get to insert that still in public education. Because I always end it with, go home and talk about what you guys believe. Um, you know, I will never, uh, I, could, I could do more examples, but, I'm, but, anyway, but, but I will never get teacher of the year. Uh, but what I hope to strive for is the knowledge that I have loved the children in my class. I've encouraged and thought, taught them to be better people. And I've given them skills to succeed in the future. Um, most children walk out of my classroom on the last day of school and I never see them again. I've invested in them a whole year. I love them. And then I will never see them, see them again in their whole life. There are times when kids do come back to see me. Um, I've had some special moments. I've had a student come back to tell me that she accepted Jesus and was baptized. Um, I've had kids come back to see me and tell me what they're doing with their life. But most of the time, I, I'll never see them again. And um, that's a real hard thing for me sometimes. But I've come, it's part of the job. Um, once in a while, I get a token from a student that that tells me that I hope I have touched them or their family. Um, I carry with me my keychain. Um, a student gave this keychain to me, and on the front it says, it takes a big heart to shape little minds, and on the back it's, it's um, 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all that you do be done in love. And that's kind of what I, that's what I strive for. When I was at a conference, um, I heard the speaker say, uh, years from now, your students won't remember what you did. They won't remember what you said. They will remember how you made them feel. Um, and so that's what I strive for in my job. Thank you, Amy, the teacher who never swears. I heard Amy say that she encourages Christians to teach at the public schools. Christians not to shy away from that, but see that as an opportunity to have an impact for the Lord in the public school system. So, uh, Amy, thank you. I didn't realize you were so funny. <laughs> and didn't you also want to ask Amy some questions too? Weren't you thinking, I'd like to ask her about that, maybe after the service. Um, would you take your hymn book again and turn to page 718, 718. When you find it, please stand. We'll sing all the verses of Day by Day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is counselor and power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he lay. As for days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation. 
So do trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble me take, ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. I wonder, would you repeat after me? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Anyways, that's just a good reminder for us that as we do our work, we're not working for the man. We're not working for the company. We're working for the Lord. So we do our best um, to honor him, to honor the Lord. So our next speaker was to be Dan Vest, but his dad has taken a a turn. His dad has cancer and uh, is not doing well. So Dan's not here this morning. But I'm wondering, is there anybody, like so far, your mind has been prompted as you've heard our first two speakers that you'd like to share maybe just a short story or a short uh, word about how you try to do your work? I will hand you to Steve. Come on up here a little bit, and I'll hand you the mic. Sir, Actually, stay right here if you don't mind. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, So my name is Steve Broda, and, um, you know, I fell into a group of of guys when I first came to Christ, and, you know, one of the big things that got hammered on me is just evangelism. And uh, I try to do that, you know, throughout my job, talking to people about Christ, and it's not always comfortable, and I can sympathize with the way that, um, you know, some people feel towards it, that they're, they're shy, they don't want to talk about it, or they don't want to interfere with other people's lives and everything. And I, and I do think about that, and it's funny because sometimes I think there's certain people who might be more receptive to Christ than others that I have as clients or maybe as colleagues. And sometimes I think that, you know, I won't present Christ to those who I feel may not be receptive, but I got to really correct myself because Christ is for everybody when it comes down to it. And um, what I try to do really is just to prepare myself. And I, I really, I think it's, it's about boldness. It's about preparing yourself and having a conviction that, hey, I'm going to talk to this guy and I'm going to work into the conversation somehow, something to do with Christ. And generally speaking, I will do that. I'll go out for a lunch or I'll go out with a meeting and uh, have that as a plan. And then, you know, a lot of people have a lot of problems and they may confide in you. You get to know people. And I think that's a big portion of it is, you know, just to um, really minister to people, really get to know them. And, you know, they will confide in you with problems that they may be having. And and you can tell them about Christ then and what he's done in your life. Um, But that's generally how I do it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'll open it up again in a few minutes. Um, uh, last week, I was talking to Doug Brush, and uh, Doug's retired now, but he's got some great stories about how he tried to let people know he was a Christian in his workplace. So, Doug, come on up here. And uh, uh, some other time, we're going to have to hear about how you live for the Lord when you've retired, because Doug is an example to all of us when a person retires of not just sitting back, but using that extra time to serve the Lord, too. That's a topic for another day. This is a scary moment for me. <laughs> um, um, where do you start? Dean changed the question. He says, how do you witness in the workplace? And then he says, how do you impact it? I have no way to measure how I impact it. But uh, you have to know where I came from. Uh, John talked about being an introvert. I was ser- severely an introvert. And um, and I uh, took Dean's question 
I went back and spent about three days going over 70 years in the workplace trying to figure out how I witness, let alone impact. And, and it took a lot of struggling to go back 70 years. And um, I mean, it, to me, it was very exciting because I could saw that, that um, I was. If I would have told Dean at the beginning, I never planned on witnessing to anybody. I never planned on being involved in service. I was totally to myself. I didn't come in, I didn't come into the church from my family, 16 when I got saved, no Christian background in my, my whole family life. I, I was brand new, I was an introvert. I didn't talk to anybody. It's a miracle that I even made a profession of faith. But I did at 16, and then uh, that was at uh, 21. I joined the Air Force in 1955, and uh, I was kind of against some of the elders at the church. They wanted me to be drafted. Either I get drafted or I enlist. I enlisted was a, a good choice. But after <clears throat> um, so many years in the Air Force, I got discharged, and I came home. And... Um, what am I going to do? I got a job. And um, but being about being a witness, well, talking about it being an introvert, when I came home back to my church, for some reason I had a desire uh, to, to come back to church. I could have joined, continued my service time in the Air Force. I loved my job. I had a great time. And I, but because of the environment of a, of a, my life in the Air Force, it wasn't the best environment. But in 1956, the five missionaries were killed in Ecuador. For some reason, that stuck with me. That, that bothered me for the balance of the three years in the Air Force. Why the Lord would take five men? Why didn't he just take me? You know, I had no value. And so that bothered me. I'd come out, come back to... Martin Road on the east side, I was east, east sider, and um, I was an introvert, and I was walking up the, I'm adding this, I was walking up the stairs, and this woman come down the stairs. Um, some of you know her, Rusty Hughes or Rusty Himmer, and she says, you're new here. I says, no, this, this is my church. And we became good friends. She had the ability to realize that I was an introvert. And I don't know how much time we spent together. This is 1959. By August 7, 59, I was a counselor at JV camp, or not JV, but um, what's, no, the, the older teenager, varsity camp. And uh, who would ever thought I would be, be a counselor? But she was able to draw me out, get me involved with Youth for Christ at Masonic Temple. And she was drawing me out of my shyness, of my introvert. And, um, and so that's where I'm for the last 70 years. I've been active. I come out of my being in. You wouldn't know it today. Um, but, but then I wouldn't talk at all to anybody. But um, I'm going to give you an assignment. I did this in junior church when I, I was here. Uh, when you go home today, I want you to to go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 21. And I want you to read it and study it each day for seven days. Because if this didn't take place in my life, I wouldn't be here today. This was the body of Christ working in my life. Moving me forward, standing beside me, building fires under me, so I would be a witness in the workplace. I got a job for working jail Hudson's. I had a 120 men in my department. It was two man crews, that's 60 crews. We're all over the city of Detroit. I was carpet installer. And the lifestyle that went on there was terrible. And uh, someone somewhere said that uh, <clears throat> to be a witness, you just live your life. If you have to use words, use few words. Oh, Christ had to live through me. So out of this, this uh, Romans chapter 12, 
these people still didn't need the work of the Holy Spirit. So God knew that my decision to leave the Air Force, come back and meet Rusty Hammer, so, all, so many other people have built fires on it to move me forward in the faith of the Lord, that made a big difference in my life. And how did I impact my workplace? I went back over that list. It was kind of an enjoyment to see I did witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. How I impacted, I don't know. But I was living my faith because of all the involvement of the body of Christ. You know, we got families here, we got families here. We interact within the body of Christ, helping each other. I had men who treated me like a son. My dad died when I was 14, so I had no, no father to look to. And they treated me like a son, and they built fires on them. And that fire is still burning today. And I'm still, like Gene said, I'm still involved. And, uh, but um, I did have an, an incident in, in the workplace um, that uh, Ephesians chapter 6, the, the, the suit of armor, I stood firm. I, I, I listened to some of these guys I worked with, and I was up on the dock, and I could hear God's name being used in, in vain over and over again. I walked down to the, the main deck, and I went over these four or five guys, and I looked at the guy, and I called him by name, and I wasn't angry. I was talking gently. I says, you know, if someday if I really get mad about something, is it okay I use your mother's name to express my anger? In other words, I drew the line in the sand for where I believed. The guys I worked with, they knew my faith. They knew that I wasn't going to swear. They knew I wasn't going to drink. They knew I wasn't going to steal. But I had to draw a line. And some of them appreciated it. And some of them, I, I, I believe, came to know the Lord uh, in the conversation I had with them. Uh, but the majority of them, they didn't want me around. I had one boss, um, Oscar, and uh, I mean, we had an incident, and then um, I was supposed to leave the job at 4.30, I left at quarter to four, went down to get paid, and he says, Doug, what time did you leave the job yesterday? I said, quarter to four. He says, I know. And from that time on, he never questioned anything I said or did. We had a lot of good conversations. The other bosses misused me. As a believer, they took advantage of what Dean was talking about, doing 100% of your responsibility to your workforce. So how do I measure? I don't measure. Because all this boils down to one thing, the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And that's how I can witness. I can't do it in my strength. I have nothing that I can offer the Lord. But he took something I thought was worthless. How I used how how. Worked out in the workforce? I don't know. I have no way of measuring in that. But it was trying years. But I thank believers, like so many here, in Martin Road and Camp and other places that build fires under me. And we need to do that with one another, from family to family. So if you see someone struggling, help them. Get involved with that. Thank you, Doug. Let's sing again. Take your hymn book. Turn to page 702. Page 702. When you find that, uh, stand with me, please. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul bread of heaven feed me till I want no more fill my cup fill it up and make me whole. let's sing it again fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting in my soul Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, 
fill it up and make me whole. Remain standing and turn over to page 669. 669. Let's sing that again. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be. Make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. Now, as you sit down, I'm going to ask you to do something. Could you scooch together? Because I'm going to give you a topic to discuss with three or four people around you. Okay? So as you sit down, uh, gather in little groups of three or four or five people. And um, I'd like you to just share with each other, what do you do? Um, if you're working a job, tell what that is. If you're retired, describe what you used to do. If you're a young person, tell what you hope to do. But I'd like to take just about three minutes now and just share with each other what is it that you uh, do uh, in your time as your, uh, as your work or your former work. All right, take just about three minutes to discuss that together.
All right, shall we wrap it up? Thank you, everyone, for sharing. That's pretty interesting stuff, isn't it? All right, let's bring it back together. Ephesians 4.28 says, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Interesting that one of the reasons that we work is so we have something to share with others. And uh, generosity is like a gift that we have uh, because we work. One of the blessings of it. All right, next up, it says, is Crystal Johnson, my dear wife. Come on up, Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal Johnson. I um, work at the University of Michigan Hospital as a physician assistant. Um, I've been blessed to work on the kidney transplant team for over 10 years there now. Um, when I think about the people that I work with, it's basically two groups. One is um, the 20 or so physicians and some nurses that I've worked with most consistently over the last uh, 10 years. Some have come and gone, but a core group of them are always there. And the second group that I work with is my patients. I have about 350 uh, kidney transplant patients that I take care of. And about 100 of them have had since the first year I started working there. So um, those are a consistent group of people that I feel like God has given me these people, and I'm sure you all have people like this, but these are the people that I spend a lot of hours of my life working with, talking with, dealing with, um, for good or for bad. Um, when I first started working at U of M, I think after maybe a year or two, uh, a coworker would have described me as someone who was happy, um, a hard worker, a good PA, um, flexible teammate, um, patients liked having um, me as their provider. But I started to think about, um, is that really all they saw me as? Um, in Ephesians, Paul urges us to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that God has given us. And so when I started to think about Though at verse, I, I asked God to help me do better at work in this. And so there's two things that I want to tell you this morning that have helped me do that. One is um, I have intentionally tried to remember coworkers and patients' life events, issues that are important to them, um, family members that are important to them, what, what world events are important to them, um, and I don't have the best memory. So what I do is I try to engage with my coworkers or my patients about these things, and then I make notes, um, and I have these notes. Um, and so when I see someone in the hallway or I'm sitting and having coffee with one of my um, docs, I just say, hey, how was your soccer game? Or um, your, your mom was sick, how is she doing? And I try to engage that intentionally, um, even with our schedules, it's, it's good to take the time to do that. The second thing that I found God leading me to do was a lot harder. Um, not only asking them for personal information, but I, the second thing I tried to do is to be more transparent in what was going on in my life. So for me, it's pretty easy to put a smile on and work at five in the morning because I'm a morning person and just be that person all day. But that's not being truthful with my coworkers or my patients because there's some days that I don't want to have that smile. And so I think God was calling me to be just more transparent with how I dealt with discouragements and trying to share with my coworkers especially how I dealt with mistakes that I made or what discouraged me about some world events, and we've all seen those world events over the last few years taking place, um, and having discussions about worries that I had, um, especially about my children, especially about children who live far away, um, and sharing with my coworkers and patients that I struggle with that. Um, and also being transparent with them about loss and sadness. When I lose a patient, um, 
and also when, especially when I um, lost my sister. Um, and I think that God has used that to, that give and take of sharing um, to build my testimony of faith, especially to my coworkers, so that they see how I deal with life as a believer. So I don't, I don't think they come to me for all the answers, but I do see that they come to me to share more problems and to ask for prayer. Um, I think they come to me knowing that I'm not going to judge them because I'm struggling with a lot of the same things that they struggle with. I hope they see me as a person who is flawed and imperfect, but a Christian who is just living life under God's grace and God's mercy. I want to end by telling you two stories that have encouraged me that maybe that is happening a little bit. Um, one is, when I first started working at U of M, I got 100 patients given to me, and three of them were siblings. They, um, they all had polycystic kidney disease. They'd all been transplanted for several years before I got them, and I became you know, their provider. And so through the last 10 or so years, I've had them as, as patients. Um, about five years ago, the oldest sibling, Jean, um, got suddenly ill with a really bad infection, and she died suddenly. And about that same time, my sister Eileen got sick, and um, I took a leave of absence to go to Alaska to be with her until, um, until her death. When I came back from that, one of the f my first week of clinic, I had uh, Loreen, who was the younger sister to the patient who had died, Jean. And um, I'm sitting in clinic with her, going over all of her medications and medical history and all that stuff. And when we get done with that, I said, is there anything else, you know, that you're, you're dealing with? And she started to cry and tell me about, she's really struggling with this loss of her sister, who she shared not only as a sibling, but she shared all her medical problems. They were all the same, you know? So um, uh, she was struggling with that loss. And it really gave me an opportunity to say, you know, I'm struggling with that loss too. So there were some tears at that visit, but there was also a time when we could just talk about how grateful we were to God, that he had given us siblings who we loved, who had good memories, and um, it actually ended with as a really just sweet time of sharing, and so I was thankful for that. My second story is about a colleague um, who uh, I worked with about three years ago, another f uh, physician um, in the transplant center, and Aman was, um, worked with us for about 18 months, and then she was fired for um, uh, poor work habit, poor compliance, issues like that. Um, and I had worked with Aman in clinic. I had actually covered for her when she didn't show up sometimes, and I had had some of her patients transfer to me because they were unhappy with her care. So I understood that aspect of it. But I had also spent time with Aman in her office and in the staff room as she shared how hard it was to be a single Muslim woman with two young boys in a country that was not her home. Um, so I understood that part of her too. So when I heard she was fired, I got a card and wrote in it and just told her I would be praying for her as she, um, that God would give her wisdom in the days ahead um, and that I appreciated what a great mom she was. And I got her one of those little willow tree angels. You picture what those are, they're little. And it was one that expressed a mother's love and I put it in her office. Uh, two days later, she left abruptly, and I never heard from her again. In June of this year, I went to um, the International Kidney Transplant Convention in San Diego. And as I was coming back from having lunch, I was walking on the sidewalk, and Aman is there, and she comes running up to me, and she gives me a hug. I haven't seen her in three years, hadn't heard from her. Um, and she was just... We spent the next 15, 20 minutes of her on the sidewalk of San Diego just telling me how life was and how she was doing. And then as we um, said goodbye, she turned to me and she said, I still have that little wooden angel sitting on my office at work because it reminds me that when life was really hard, God sent someone who saw me, who cared for me, and who said they would pray for me. Let us try to work and ask God to help us walk in a manner that is worthy of this calling that he has given us.
Thank you, Dara. Um, don't you find that, that increasingly in life, there are places where you're the only Christian people know? You know, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe at your workplace, you're the Christian that they know. And um, that's not a bad thing. You know, we're not lamenting how there's not more Christians out there. You have a, a great opportunity because people come to you. You're the Christian. You're the one they ask for the Christian view of things. You're the one that they go to when they're sad and they don't know who else to talk to. That's a, a great honor for us. Um, okay, so go ahead. Jamie Yonker is supposed to be next, but he fell. He's gone upstairs. He hurt his knee, and he already had bad knees. So um, I'm wondering, is there anybody who'd like to take uh, a minute to just tell us a story or give us a word about how you have tried to do your work as a Christian? Yeah, Graham. I was a public school teacher also for 40 years. And uh, one of the things that I did early on is we started a Christian club. So I identified as the teacher that was sponsoring that club. So everybody knew right up front where I stood. And even as a, a substitute teacher, the first year I was teaching, before I had a permanent job, I had some opportunity to share the gospel with a young man, came to school drunk. I happened to be on my break hour and found him in the hall, I was able to share the gospel with him and encourage him to turn from his bad habits. But uh, one, one time uh, in my mid-career, uh, we were on strike, the teachers, and our administrators in our building had asked us to come in. And I made the public declaration that I was going to go in. Everybody was opposed to that, of course. And the, my reason for doing it was what John shared earlier, that uh, we should be obedient to our bosses and do what so, so uh, that was a great opportunity for me to share later on as teacher after teacher came to me to apologize for the way some of the teachers behaved as I entered the building that morning and uh, the reason that I did it was what I was able to share with them and how I was committed to the Lord and felt that was my responsibility. Um, one of the highlights I felt in my uh, career was an opportunity that I had. We were uh, in a district-wide in-service getting training to improve our teaching ability with kids, and it wasn't going well. Nobody liked it. Uh, it was a waste of time, even in my eyes. But our principal came to us, and they were planning a big group meeting with all the instructors at the park here in Plymouth, with about 300 teachers. And they came to us in the art department, wondering if we could do something creative that would encourage people to be more involved. And I came up with the idea that I could do a presentation that I called Kids Are Like Pots. Uh, I was a pottery teacher at the time. And uh, I had probably a dozen or 15 different pots, and I gave them the characteristics that students would have like the cereal size bowl or soup bowl. The, it'd be like the student that was compliant, was there every day, faithfully doing their work. And they were like a soup bowl and had some little ones with fancy decoration inside. The, they had a spark of something in their life that was uh, no one expected, and that was a pleasant surprise. Uh, at the end, after talking about all these different kinds of students, I brought out this beautiful big pot, 
and I smashed it and showed how sometimes as teachers we were uh, having input in the kids' lives where it crushed them and the, it wasn't helpful at all to their development. And uh, I was known as the teacher that was kind and considerate of all students and I often got the students that were troublesome or had special needs because I would uh, seek to meet their needs and do my best in that situation. So uh, that was overwhelming to a lot of the teachers. I had teachers in tears when they realized that that was what they were doing and it helped turn the whole uh, situation around where we were more interested in improving ourselves. Um, I'm grateful for the time I've had in the public schools that the Lord has been able to use me in that way. Wow. Thank you, Graham. You need to write a book. Can we sing together again? Would you take your hymn book, turn to page 686. This will be the last song that we sing. 686. And let's stand together as we sing, O oh God, our help in ages past. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure sufficient is thine arm alone and our defense now the last verse the last verse O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou my guide while life shall last and our eternal home. Thank you. Be seated. I want to thank all of our speakers this morning. I feel like it's been a really instructive and interesting morning. I just want to close our service by sharing some announcements. Um, uh, Steve, come on up here. And if, uh, Steve's overseeing our men's ministry now, and he's going to tell us about an opportunity for the men uh, this coming Saturday. Guys, there's a breakfast available. Thank you, Dean. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our, uh, our men's ministry. And... Um, you know, our goal in the ministry itself is to encourage next steps in our walk with Christ, and that can take on different forms, whether it be, you know, regular attendance and participation here at Lake Point or attending a men's ministry events that we're going to be having this year or joining a small group or maybe even achieving new spiritual goals such as uh, salvation, baptism, or even communion. And basically, as I you know, listen to the folks talk today. I mean, it's, it's all about iron sharpening iron. And, you know, you hear these uh, things that people are doing at work and, and you learn from them. And that's what this whole series is about for us to encourage one another, um, hold ourselves accountable to God. Um, the four programs that we're going to have, it's going to be broken up into the first one's going to be the men's breakfast. And we'll have a topical discussion. Um, Tom Griffith is our cook, and if you don't come for the discussion, you got to come for Tom's cooking. It's fantastic. Um, and uh, the second one is going to be service projects, and these are going to rotate throughout the year, and uh, basically we're going to be helping those with projects that they may not be able to do. And uh, both Tom, or uh, I'm sorry, Nick Gandolfo and John Flynn are going to help lead that up, and our first one's gonna be October 7th, and we're gonna have more information published on that. I think we're gonna be doing oil changes out in South Lyon. Um, another aspect of it will be book study. Uh, last year we did Becoming a King, and that took place over January and uh, February, about six weeks long, and both Ben and uh, 
G and, and Jason Liguri had handled that, and I believe that they're gonna be continuing in that study with another aspect of it. And the way that I look at this um, ministry is, you know, something that I call the square evangelizing and edifying. The edifying part comes in in attending these series, you know, you, you grow in Christ, and you know, again, it's to help encourage our walk with Christ. And I think the evangelizing size come in that I would definitely encourage you to invite uh, either neighbors, family, um, friends, or uh, colleagues, um, any one of them, um, to come to this. And we would like to grow this ministry and help others to, to grow in Christ. And uh, ladies, we would prayerfully ask you to encourage your men in your life, whoever they may be, to come join us, because you are a big part in what we do as well. And the last thing I wanted to say is, you know, something about boldness and opportunity. Um, I think it's in Matthew chapter 9 and John 4 that Jesus talks about the harvest being white or being white and ready uh, for harvest and that there's few workers for it. And what you see from that is that there's plenty of opportunities, but what we need is the boldness to take advantage of those opportunities. And I would uh, ask you all to, to, to pray for that boldness and take a step into, um, you know, into getting involved a little bit more and, and really um, working through your faith in that way. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, just say a prayer for this ministry, if we can bow our heads for a second. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your ministry, Lord, and that you've given us opportunities to, uh, to work with you. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would give wisdom um, and guidance for those who are going to be involved with the ministry and putting it on. We pray that we would handle your truths accurately, Lord, and present them in a way that would be pleasing to you. Lord, we pray that you would free up the schedules for, um, you know, for the men, that they may be able to see this as an important thing, that we can get good attendance coming to these uh, various uh, meetings that we'll be having. Lord, we lift it all up into you, and we pray this, and we, um, we just ask and want to give you all the glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, I want to remind you about another thing that's going on next Saturday. It's our laundromat outreach in conjunction with Cornerstone Church in Detroit. We're meeting at the Coinomatic. You see the uh, address there. And as people walk in, we're going to give them a bag of quarters and Tide Pods and laundry sheets. Uh, there's going to be coloring pages for the kids. And uh, then we're just going to try to talk to people. And we're going to encourage them to attend Cornerstone Church, which is right by this uh, laundry mat. So you don't have to come for the whole time. Come for any part of that uh, 1 to 4 p.m. All right. Um, I want to remind you that Awana begins on Monday, September 11th with Awana Fest at 6 p.m. Is that my last announcement? All right. I want to close our service with um, what's called a prayer for Labor Day. Almighty God, creator of the world, we give you thanks for the gift of work. It gives us purpose. We desire to work for your glory. Deliver us from the service of self alone, that we may do our work in truth and beauty and also for the good of others. We ask that you help us be generous. Instruct us on how, we, uh, on how much of our pay to use, how much to save, and how much to give away. Thank you for today, this day of rest and tomorrow. Help us to understand the patterns of work and Sabbath. Show us how to live lives that are focused on your purpose in our work and in our rest. Our work is not always easy, but we know you gave it to us to honor you. Help us to see work as your creation designed to help give us purpose, fulfillment, and to be a light in this world. May our work matter not just uh, to our uh, business and company, but also to your kingdom. Renew our strength in our workplaces, and help us to always work with all of our hearts as unto you. We ask these things for our good and for your glory. Amen.